right, welcome everyone. We have another very special episode today. The man, the myth, he's known as DJ Ski. It is Scott. If I'm saying you're, I, I, I like the DJ Ski. I was just gonna ask, how did you get it? Where did it come from? But I see the combination of your name, Scott. How are exactly. you? Exactly, you figured it out. Everybody doesn't get there. Like, where do you get it from? And yeah, it's just a combination of my real name. So you, good, 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 uh, good observation. I love it, man. I love it. Well, listen, I got, there's a lot to talk about. We share some mutual friends. I, we got a lot of similar interests. I don't even know where to begin. You do a lot of different things. You're obviously a world-class DJ. Uh, you also are very much into sports cards and that is something I'm very passionate about. So maybe let's start there. Tell me about, about sports cards. Where did you find this passion? Is this something that's new or were you always into this as a child growing up? Yeah, ever since, you know, I got into sports after I moved to Minneapolis and watched the Twins win the World Series back in 91. So so that was what hooked me and, and, and got me hooked as, you know, a young, young, young child and just into sports and sports cards was my first, you know, entrepreneurial endeavor. I used to, you know, set up a shop in my like, you know, garage and try to get just for my neighborhood kids and stuff to, to buy. But, uh, you know, it's something that I've always been into. And, you know, as of recent, you know, really got back heavy into we launched a fund called Mint 10, where we're buying cards like the, you know, we notably made a, you know, we bought the million dollar one of one Mike Trout um, platinum rookie card. We've been invested in several companies in the space, um, already had a few exits, but yeah, it's, uh, and I also have been, you know, rolling out my own cards with tops and on my own in partnership with like brands like eBay and yeah, just doing a lot of fun stuff in the space. We've got, we did a content series with whistle called card clout where we featured everybody from like Snoop Dogg to, you know, Deshaun Watson and all these different players talking about like, you know, the intersection of like sports, music, culture, and getting stories behind a lot of the, the cards and even like the images on them and stuff. So it's, it's fun. I love the space. I'm super deep into it and couldn't be more excited for it, especially, you know, this year moving, moving forward. I think, you know, it, we obviously had a lot of hype during COVID. There was a little like slow downturn, I think last year. And I think now that that was just a market correction. And now I think, you know, it's off to the races again. For sure. I mean, similar to crypto, right? These are just like, this happens in the markets. There's the mm -hmm. sports cards went up so much. It was just rampant. The, the COVID, the, I think the last dance, that kind of stuff also helps. There's just all these things at the right time that made sort of sports cards more popular and kind of get reinvented, if you will. And I think I, it's just one of those things where it was due for a correction. And some people say, oh, it's like, you know, it was a bust or it's a, it, it's, it's a dud. But really, you know, I think it's, it's still, if you look at where it was three years ago, five years ago, to where it is now it's pretty impressive and also i just think like with with DraftKings and these different sites right like prize picks and these daily fantasy betting sites i think sports cards also are just so much more popular there's so much more kind of you know in game people are more in tune to statistics and data and this technology is so well so big right now with with nfts as well i just think it all kind of works together and it makes people sort of find that love and people like yourself or me i'm 35 i have a two-year-old son i don't do you, do you have any kids or no 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 kids but yeah no it's a you know there's a whole new generation growing up yeah with it. it's like it's kind of like it's like now my, our generation is getting back into it maybe we had a love for it or a hobby or collecting some i mean i you know jason Kuntz, who i believe you know pretty well um, he, he got me really back into it and he's from Michigan. I'm from Michigan and I kind of took him my old collection when through a mutual friend, brought him all my stuff and, you know, it wasn't valuable. I kind of missed it being in the, the, uh, the early nineties when I was really collecting, but there is people that are a little bit older now that used to collect and they're kind of re finding their passion love for it. So I think there's more money coming into it and just all signs sort of point that it's going to be enhanced and, and more lucrative. It, it, what about NFTs for you? Is this, are you more the physical sports cards or are you in diving in the nft world as well both like look i i love everything and i'm so you know on, on the, the physical side i think you know it's it's great and we've the, the fund we just focus on on physical trading cards and in, in companies in that space is we think that there's just stability right like they've been around for hundreds of years in, in essence right you're looking at the late 1800s with the first you know sports cards created um the nfts on the other side of you know super super bullish on although i think there is a lot of you know hype in the market similar to you know how you were just talking about with uh with, with other things but that but i think that you know the utilities and the opportunities in the future are endless you know I'm, I'm super deep in the metaverse side through through dash we have our metaverse studios and our powering games inside and the most popular experiences inside platforms like roblox inside of uh you know utilizing unreal engine for discord where their official you know music bot and you know produce their festivals um and you know so so i'm su extremely bullish on just you know web3 metaverse nft in general although i think in, in all of those sectors there's you know a significant amount of you know hype and you know things that are not going to be long lasting yeah I, I'm, but it's just like the early days in anything so yes and that's 
Yeah, it is tricky because you do realize a lot of stuff. Most people can say, oh, it's a scam or this and that. But like, look, it, it's it's definitely the future and there will be some winners. There'll be some losers. That's just the nature of the beast. So yeah. uh, I'm with you. I'm definitely with you. And wh which of this, could you explain a little bit about this here? So on your on your website here, there is some drops and we, we see some cards are sold out. What What is this specifically? That we're yeah, so these are all the cards I did with, with Tops as part of Project 70. And then some of the ones that I did on my own um, that we just released uh, in, in numbered versions on my site. Um, so for, for this project, I decided to really take you know where where i sit which is this intersection like on in my my dj brand at the intersection of like sports music and culture you know i've obviously started off in, in music and in the mixtape game and, and coming up from radio and tv etc and then you know have evolved into you know doing you know creating content with sports teams djing games you know i still go back and do all my hometown vikings entertainment uh as i as i grew up there and can't can't get rid of my minnesota set of sports loyalties but now i've evolved in doing everything for like university of Michigan now, so um, to you know NASCAR and everything in between. Uh, so when I did this card series with Tops, it brought me back to my days of like designing mixtape covers, which we had to do, and that's how we got listeners. You know, the only thing when they were sitting on short store shelves was people would buy or, or you know pick them up based on that cover. So I decided for for my card series to kind of combine sports and music where I take the, the 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 sports element and the baseball players and teams and then pair them with different musical artists and doing things like prints with Kirby Puckett to tie into to you know what it was like in the 80s and 90s in, in Minneapolis and you know Kirby was my favorite athlete as a baseball player as a kid um, you know Prince the greatest musician of all time took me on the road with him and took you know was was fortunate enough to 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 work with him along that way so tying those things together as well as like putting together new school like Fernando Tatis and his favorite artist Bad Bunny um, tying in cities one of my favorites was Outcast AT Aliens and Ronald Acuna Jr. so um, being able to put those out was was phenomenal. Like you can see the Mike Trout, like right right there with, uh, you know, which is inspired by Death Row Records and actually Dr. Dre's platinum plaque that I have. And we did that because it was the platinum one of one trout that I bought that's in the bottom right corner for the fund with Mint Tin that we spent a million dollars on. So there's all these like little tie-ins and storytelling things. Mickey Mantle, Eminem, just could play off of the names. Um, Honus Wagner from Pittsburgh with Wiz Khalifa, Kush and OJ. So all mine really have a lot, like there's a hundred layers and stories and you can see some of the videos and even listen to um, they have a companion podcast that you can listen to on Spotify with all the musical inspiration. So you can see why Satchel Paige and, you know, Nas Illmatic went hand in hand there, Jay-Z and Babe Ruth. So it's, it's, it's been such a super fun project. And, you know, I was overwhelmed by the reaction for it this year. It was, you know, and can't wait for a lot of, you know, new card projects launching uh, later on this year in 2022. Yeah, it's really cool. How, how does that work with... Um like Babe Ruth, for example, and some of these, these are, you know, Satchel Page, these older guys that have maybe passed away or the rights are different. How does this work with NFTs and sports cards now? If uh, let's say this Babe Ruth one, for example, are you familiar with the kind of inner workings and how do you, how do, how do these deals get done? Is it through their family or uh, foundations? Yeah. Like where, where did, how do the rights to these cards and, and NFTs sort of work? Yeah, so it's the same thing. It's through their states, right? So whoever owns and does that, or if they're a retired player through that. Of course, for current players, you just go through the players' associations and leagues. There's two different sets of licenses. There's the the logo and use marks for for teams and, and individual players, or for the uh, for the teams and their logos, and then actual players, which are separate. So you need to get both of those for current players as well as you know past logos. Um, and then for players that are not currently active, you need to go to either them directly or their states if they're passed away, and and do that and you know with the with this series with tops they already have the rights obviously to um to a significant amount of players through the cards that we put out so we're able to to leverage and and jump on the um you know i guess what they what they already have and and put that out through their system through their ecosystem and, and what, what what to you is more fun to to sort of work on music and dj or to do a project like this and be more on the creative side with with uh within this space what what do you if you have a free hour what are you like first looking to get more involved in and do? And I love it all, man. Honestly, like I'm, I'm just a creative at, at, at heart. And whether that comes to business and creating new businesses that are fun, whether that's you know creating music and DJing and entertaining people and creating mixes to to creating products from the ground up, like these these cards. It's you know I, I don't think I could live just doing one thing. You know, people always ask what I do for fun as a joke, and, and you know I'm fortunate enough where I've been able to find what I love to do for fun and make a career out of it. So um, it's it's never working. It's always just doing you know something fun yeah and, and what do you remember was there a moment in time you know that's something that that i always 
like to say, it's like being busy is great, right? If there's stuff that you always have that you're thinking like the next thing that's fun to do, was there a moment when you kind of went from doing something that you weren't necessarily in love with or just sort of working at a job that you realize that now, like whether it's being a DJ or other projects that you're able to do what you love at all times, was there a moment in your career that you remember like an inflection point or something that happened that allowed you to kind of break in and just, just have this freedom? Yeah, for me, I mean, I, I got my start, I grew up in Minneapolis, as you know, and, um, you know, I, I, I was DJing when I was a teenager, ended up on radio when I was young. And it started off with a 4 a.m. shift on Saturday night with, you know, two listeners in a small community station in Minneapolis. Yeah. And from that, just built up my network, started selling my mixtapes in stores and got connected to Steve Rifkind, who was the CEO of Loud under Sony Records at the time, and wrote him a whole outline. You know, I actually met him because I was selling, I never worked a real job. I was selling PS2s at the time to my friends all would work at Target or Best Buy. So I'd find out when the shipments were coming in and, and go buy them and sell them for double the money on eBay. But a, a mutual DJ friend, Stretch Armstrong, connected us because he knew I had them. And Steve happened to mention he needed one for his son right before Christmas. So I hooked him up, stayed close with him, and then just sent him some ideas that I had for his label and idea. And you know he loved it so much, he, he told me to come meet with him. So I ditched high school one day, flew to New York, met with him, and he offered me a job. So when I, you know, figured a way to graduate high school early, left, you know, when I was 17, uh, packed a U-Haul, drove across the country to LA and luckily it, it worked out. Well, wow. it's pretty, pretty amazing story. I mean, that's <laughs> the thing. I think one of the, the biggest sort of reminders about business and just life too, is like, you kind of do create your own opportunities. You create your own luck. I love to say about the yeah. you know, preparation, luck is one preparation meets opportunity. So it sounds yeah. like you were, you were, a uh, a grinder and, and sort of had a, a just determination and early hunger for, like you said, business and just kind of doing creative, fun stuff. When did you know that you were um, going to be be doing DJ at a, at a, at a fairly yeah. high level? Because I think I did see the video about your um, with the Minnesota Vikings. You know, I actually saw yeah. you spinning at Ann Arbor for the Ohio State Michigan game. That was a yeah. pretty fun, very epic game. And you know, I was hoping you'd come over. I thought you were maybe going to get to meet up with Jason was going to meet in person, but um, yeah, that was amazing. And you've been doing the Vikings. So how did that, um, that all happen where it looked like it was going to yeah. be a one-off game and then it turned into sort of like a, your staple for each home game. Is that correct? Yeah, it's just, you know, it's, and then it's a great way to put it. It's just taking advantage of opportunities, right? And like going all out. When, when I started DJing, the, the first part of the question, you know, I knew that this is what I was going to do as soon as I got behind the turntables and not from like a, an overly like cocky, like, yeah, I'm going to be the biggest DJ in the world and do this. I was just like, oh no, this is what I love. Like, this is what I'm going to, going to do. Like no questions asked, like didn't even think of anything else and, and went all in on that kind of vision and dream. And then, you know, along the way, I've been fortunate enough to hit different milestones and it didn't happen overnight. I, I actually moved to LA to work in the music industry side of things. Like Steve didn't hire me because I was a DJ. There's a million other DJs. That's kind of what how I connected with him, but he brought me in because of the ideas and, you know, the mind and the marketing side that I had. And, you know, we signed artists like Akon and had had an incredible run over at SRC. Um, but my DJ career then took off when I was producing for Game and then, you know, Snoop and Kendrick Lamar and all the, the West Coast guys and became kind of the, the de facto West Coast mixtape DJ. But then lever wasn't happy with that and leveraged that to becoming, you know, big radio DJ on stations like Sirius, Power 106 in Los Angeles, Kiss FM, iHeartRadio, helping launch that entire brand, um, going to Vegas. Vegas, opening up clubs like Excess, being the, you know, I think behind AM at the time, I was the second highest paid DJ um, in, in Vegas. In the, well, in, those in contracts now. are crazy. I know Jason Strauss really well, and he um, <laughs> he shared some of the insights on, and I know it's gotten to become a bidding war at some of the new properties it's and insane. stuff. So that's, a, that's to hear that if you're, yeah, even on the... On the, in the, on the list there as a, it, yeah. it, it gets pretty wild, those numbers. So it, it was nuts. And you know, like, look, I was there before it got too, too crazy, unfortunately, but still was able to ride that wave and, and do those things. And then, you know, evolve from that. Like I never wanted to be the guy that, as I aged up, like I look at, you know, life as an evolution. I started off in mixtapes. That's not what, you know, I, 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 I'm doing now. I went to radio. It's not, you know, obviously I'm doing the dash stuff, but not doing the day to day show. Like I was, I used to be on radio for six hours a day, every single day. And then, you know, doing the clubs, which was fun and loved it at the moment. But, you know, it's my nightmare now to be out every night till, you know, I, I used to do, I'd fly out last flight, go on excess. Prime time was like 1230 to about, you know, 230. Um, then go to after hours at Dre's just to pick up a second check. Right. And, and that was from like four to six 
leave the club in the daytime, take a flight back to, to LA and just crash all day. And like, it was fun at the moment and to, to run around the world and tour and see those things. But that's not what I, I knew. Like, look, it's not sustainable. It's, you know, so, yeah. and, and then now to evolve into the next phase, which is me really doing like, you know, these giant stadiums doing things like, you know, with, with NASCAR at the LA Coliseum, the first time they've ever had a live DJ during a race, hyping up, you know, in, in Michigan and, uh, and going out there for like the big game. And, and, yeah, tell, and tell me about the NASCAR. Cause I think that was what, February 6th or last month. Uh, yeah. not too long ago and that was a first um how, how did that go and is it is, is it more is it more pressure than playing at like an excess or is it because they're you know it's yeah. different it's new it's not a normal venue and also how maybe the crowd will react or understand and how how's the system work how maybe there's things you're not thinking totally. about the other side I mean, how, how does that differentiate DJing sports is, is a total different beast than anything else. Like it's easy. It's a relatively easy when you go into a club, if you're a DJ, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know what your set's going to be. It's a couple thousand people at most, you know, and they're there for, for that. They know the genre of music, right? Like depending on what DJ you are, like if you're going out to see, you know, Tiesto, you know, he's playing house music, right? Like that's what he plays. So that crowd goes for that. When it's sports, you have people there that all have their own ideas and they're not necessarily coming for the music. They're coming to be entertained and the, the game is the primary element of that. But if you look at things like NFL, there's 14 minutes of game time in, you know, a six hour day from the time the gates open until, until they close. So we have to fill all those things in and uh, an appeal to not only like the, uh, like if you look at Michigan, right? Like there's a student section behind, but also the, the, the older donors, you know, young random people coming in, like all walks of life, everybody that has different musical tastes. And again, you have to realize that, you know, why they are there and it's about entertaining and engaging and, you know, crossing over. And, and especially with NASCAR, right? Like that's another extreme. That's an audience that's primarily country and, and, and it's, yeah. you know, non-traditional from the majority of other sports. And they've never had like, a live DJ during, you know, a race and during those cautions, which there were sig significant amount of cautions, right? Because it was such a small track. And, you know, the, the way that I approached it was like, look, you have to, I knew we were in LA, so I wanted to establish that and also like go on my foundation and roots and play like the Dre's and the Snoop's that everybody knows and was open to, but then also like mix in the country, mix in the dance, mix in the pop, do something for everybody. And it was funny because there was, you know, looking in social media when they announced that, you know, it was myself, Pitbull and Ice Cube as the performers there, there was backlash. I'm like, oh, why, how, why is there going to be a DJ during a race? And then the most exciting thing was not only leadership of NASCAR coming back and saying how, how much they enjoyed it, but looking at some of the posts and the reactions from people like, I didn't think I would like this, but it actually was great. And to be able to connect between those worlds, it's, you know, with DJs, we all have the same records. It's like, you know, a lot of things in life, right? Like we all have the same tools. It's just how you frame and position and like kind of combine them. And yeah. You know, by doing so many sports stadiums now, I've really carved out a lane in that world. And I just enjoy it. I love sports. Like I grew up, you know, I, I just love like my favorite part in, the, you know, going to the games too was watching, you know, the, the pregame introductions in the NBA. And like still nothing is more iconic to me that gives me goosebumps if I want to watch a video of the Michael Jordan Bulls intro, yeah, right? Or Alan yeah, Parsons Project big. Serious playing. So yeah. like I, I live off of those moments and, you know, have done things, you know, across NFL, uh, NBA, MLB now. Uh, we do all the stuff with Ice Cube and his league, Big Three, now NASCAR, Michigan, and in college sports. Um, we've done stuff across like extreme sports with the X Games, et cetera. So, um, you know, I've really, you know, I think we have the best, you know, just by doing it so many times and being in so many venues from arenas, multiple different sports, like I just understand that. And ha again, have a true passion for it and, and, and look at it as a challenge, but it's definitely far more difficult than doing radio where you're formatted and you know what songs you have to play, doing a club where people are there. This one is, you know, A, it's a lot bigger so that, you know, you have in Michigan, 111,000 people that are there, NASCAR, you know, hundreds of, like, it's just insane the size of these crowds and stadiums. And you have yeah. to deal with like sound systems and timing and all those things and realizing that this is just one of many elements there and making it play together well. But um, it's yeah. it's so much fun and, and, and I love it. And it's just, you know, it's it's been a great evolution of, of my career and a place that I'm happy to, to really uh, to be right now. And, and can you talk to me a little bit about your team and all that goes into what you do? Because, you know, I, I do... You know, I see like Steve Aoki, right, who is also a lot of similar interests, poker um, yeah. and sports cards and also mutual friends and stuff. And just seeing like the, the type of stuff you guys do, your websites, how many projects you have, bookings, you know, also being able to still be creative, do your own music and do it all. And it's sort of like from an outsider perspective, like, I, you know, compared to like a Gary V of, of what you guys are doing, it's like you guys are just like machines. Like it's just almost like impossible to output. Tell me a little bit about what goes into your your. uh 
you know, how, how you get everything done. And, and also if you can speak on your relationship with Steve and, and, and how you're able to do what he does. 100%, right? Like, there, you know, like, look, for, for me, again, like, it goes back to doing what I love. So you find a way to make it happen at the end of the day, and you find the time, like, you know, the schedule, especially right now is insane. But um, like, look, when you have momentum, when things are hot, you've got to ride that that wave, especially in the entertainment industry, like you're, you're only as hot as your last hit and what you've done, you know, last week. So you have to always constantly be pushing in those things and never get complacent with that. Um, and, and it is all about having a team, um, especially when it comes to the business and the entrepreneurial sides so on, on the dash side, like I've been fortunate over the years since we launched to just put together such a phenomenal crew that really takes care of it and, and allows me to, you know, drive the vision, bring in the connections, help oversee those things, but really, you know, it's hiring great people and giving them the freedom to, to go out and, and execute. We've been fortunate enough to build just such a phenomenal team that has grown that business to, to what it is on that side. Um, and then on my, on, and on my personal stuff it's, and DJ stuff, yeah, it's, you know, getting the people around to, um, that, that help out and assist on the production side. Like I have such, you know, incredible, like creative team, um, and just good friends around and stuff. And I, you know, I haven't for, for a few years now used even any agency or anything i've done it you know i've chosen to do it kind of my myself not that i'm opposed to it but just that you know i've learned and i've been with the the caas and the big agencies and well they're okay you know you you're never going to fight for no matter even with your when you're with the big agents you're always going to fight for yourself bigger you know more than anybody else and you know you want to find people that are just as passionate so you know i've, I've really hired a team around me that's that's our own crew and we just kind of go out and find ways to to make it happen. And in terms of Steve, I've known Steve forever. So it's been so great to watch his success. And, you know, he it, we do share a lot of the same interests from collectibles and sports cards, obviously music. You know, it's funny, we've both done things different. Like he started off in in, in dance and, and EDM music, whereas I've always been on like the hip hop pop side. Um, he's into collectibles, but his core focus is like, Pokemon, Magic, etc. Now, obviously, what he's doing with with the, with his whole uh, with the whole MetaZoo stuff is phenomenal. Whereas so I've always been like sports, baseball, basketball, football. Um, so it's you know, it, and you know, why, he's an inspiration for what he's done. Obviously, he's an incredible serial entrepreneur. Um, just really, really smart, and, and a guy that like at the end of the day, it's hard work. Like he grinds. He's on the road like 300 days pre pandemic, like 300 days a year. Like that's not easy you know like no matter what the money is that's that's there it's like getting up being on a plane like just the the, the physical toll on your body and he, he's just a machine and, and inspiring and like you know when you think you you have to do a lot and travel and all that stuff you just look at somebody like him and it's you know it's uh it's it's impressive what what's your preference do you like if you could have it your way if you could just kind of have the, the the venues and the the work in your area or do you enjoy the grind and the the, the, the sh you know shooting around different cities venues stadiums like what what to you is is more fun or preferential at this time and has it changed over the years now as you've gotten a little bit or older and more experienced yeah, great question. I mean, I, I love it. You know, I've, you know, I, I cherish the moments when I get, I'm able to get home and, and relax and chill and things because they're few and far in between. But I think that, you know, and I, and I lounge for that much more of that. But, you know, I think if I was doing that, it'd be the opposite. It's the grass is always greener. And you always want what you don't have. Like, it's still so enjoyable. Yeah. And I've made a conscious effort over the past few years to like actually, you know, take time when I'm going to new places and seeing things. It used to be, I'd just be like in and out. So people would be like, oh, you're going to this or going to that. I'm like, yeah, but I'm landing, I'm jumping in a car, going to the hotel, going to the venue, going to sleep, waking up, early mornings flight. So you don't see any of it. Um, and I've made a conscious effort to try to um, enjoy some of those moments and get a, a little schedule like downtime and take some time for yourself and, and enjoy that that stuff. But yeah, and, and because of that, I've grown to love traveling and, and seeing those things. And, you know, I'm, I think I've like status this year alone, even in a pandemic year on like five airlines right now. So it's, <laughs> you know, there's, uh, you know, I, I definitely enjoy getting out and seeing that. And, and there's not, still nothing better than in real life connections. And, and you have, do you have a hard time? Do you feel like saying no? Because you, you get so many opportunities, so many offers, even like this coming on a podcast, you know, there's just so many demands, right? As you get more things that people ask more from you, do you, do you ever feel like, I guess I should say, how do you deal with that? Do you say no easily or do you think you, you have a hard time? Yeah. I mean, you have to say, you have to set limits and you have to say no to more things than you say yes with, especially, I mean, A, to just protect your brand, but you just can't take on that many projects. I've done that early on where it's like, oh, let's do everything. It's just, 
not sustainable and you actually end up being less effective from that. So for me, it's like, you know, being like even podcasts, like I don't do very many of them, but I wanted to do yours because of, you know, obviously who, who you are and I'm a fan of it and you've seen all the people that you, you know, all the mutual friends that we have. So I'm like, all right, let's, let's do these things. But, um, you know, for, for me, many times it's, you know, it's more important to say no and focus on, the, on those great things. Even if you, you're not going to get every opportunity, you don't need to catch every dollar that comes in. Um, it's being very selective, even on the DJ side, right? Like that's why I, I'm not the guy that's out because I have so many other things going on. I, I, I don't want to be out, you know, five nights a week DJing, touring the world. I want to do the biggest events and the coolest things. And if you see me at something, you know, it's something great. And then that way it also, you know, adds to, to that mystique and makes that event hopefully cooler and things and, and makes it something that's legit. I've tried to build my brand in a way where everything I do is super authentic and done for the right reasons and super, you know, uh, hopefully it comes across as something that's meaningful. Very, very cool. And do you do you see yourself? Is it do you see yourself transitioning from DJing and get do you just like more into the business side of things, or is DJing something you just see yourself doing for for so long? Like, do you have you thought about like the five ten year plan on what it looks like in terms of musically in your career? Yeah, I think I've evolved from that, those things, right? Like, I was in that daily grind, like being a DJ, being in the club every week, every night doing the radio, doing the TV show, which, which was a grind in those things. And I still enjoy and do those elements, but you know, I, I intentionally like left radio, stopped doing the TV show, stopped doing all the club performances to, to focus on building a business and getting that right. We had real, you know, we've raised real money from that, from top tier VCs and backers, you know, I'm still blown away by the, the, the level of investment in the team that I've been able to raise and put around me from our board, having, you know, like owners of sports teams, the chairman of the biggest, you know, movie studio and in, in, in the world, you know, like just an incredible team around me. Um, but I, I decided like a look to, to get in, I had to focus all my energy and effort on that. Now that, you know, we've gotten that to a place where it's, you know, been successful in running those things. You know, I, I'm able to, you know, DJ and do these fun games and events and those things. I always say like the sports stuff is kind of, you know, my weekend fun job. It's a, it's a creative release. Same with doing cards. I mean, I've been fortunate enough where they've been successful and where they're turning into real businesses, but it's something that, that, that wasn't really the goal. It's just, it's something fun and creative. And, um, and so I think, you know, I'm, I'm always going to keep these, these things up for, for as long as I'm having fun doing it. That's awesome. What, and what about relaxing, unwinding? What, what are some things you do after, you know, it's because some of these hours are tough, right? You finish late. Um, it's oh, not yeah. necessarily just the show. Like there's, there's other stuff afterward you, yeah. you have to unwind with you. Do you have any good routine? Do you meditate? Do you, you know, do you have some kind of, um, daily rituals you'd like to do when you when you're performing or, or at, operating in some of these these venues and, and high you know very high energy places. Yeah, I try to you know I try to you know routines. It's tough to follow, especially when you're on the road. But sticking to them as much as possible. But for me, like I've realized, in order for me to be successful and perform at my best, I need to get enough sleep. I need to you know drink enough water. I need to to eat healthy. I need to get my exercise in. I need to take time too. Like sometimes you, when you get overwhelmed, to just step away and step back for a second, and clear and say. Sometimes even when you have a lot of things to do, if I'm just not in that mode, especially a lot of that I do, even on the business side is creative. It's creating, you know, new entities, new companies, new, new ideas and visions. It's not just as simple as like, you know, doing something that's like, oh, what's that, that, that there's a clear path for. So in order to be creative, you need to be functioning at your best. And I'll just take those moments and step away and you know, take a, a night off and sometimes just zone out and play video games because I'm like, I need to, to get away. I'm not being productive. This is not useful. Um, and coming back to maximum capacity. And that's something that I wish I learned earlier on in terms of all of that, but you have to really take care of yourself. I try to, you know, meditate for, you know, at least a few minutes every day. I, I don't accomplish it every day, but get like my meditation, my stretch, go outside, like, um, eat right, like not eat too late, like doing all the things, the little things that are, you know, keys to, to a healthy lifestyle, which make you perform perform and function at your best. And that's why I think I'm able to take on so much and do it all at a high level and perform and execute across the, the, the board because I do take care of myself and, and take all of those things into account. Whereas, you know, I think when I was younger and starting, I didn't and would maybe put in even more hours, but they were less productive from that and wasn't getting the same outcomes. Absolutely. And, and where is, you know, I see Kanye West has this new specialized platform. It's like $230. There's a lot of talk about me, music and the middleman and how much money actual artists are making and, and from their own music where, where do you kind of stand on this and, and i would love to hear a perspective about what you believe the future entails because it, it does seem a bit crazy on how these companies you know of course they're providing a service liquidity 
users, listeners, and, and there's, there's costs for that, right? It's not just mm -hmm. like they're just stealing and taking all the money, but you know, what are your thoughts on this and what do you think the future holds? Like we've seen the generation of Napster and yeah. this, CDs and Walkmans and, and all these different things. What is next and what will be happening coming up with music for, for monetization and artists? Sure, it's it's interesting, and that's why I'm super bullish about what Web three and NFTs and you know the metaverse can can offer. Because like if you look at if you take it, I, I'm probably of a different perspective. I came up in because you're all a, a figure of your own background. I came up doing mixtapes, which are you know gray gray market area. We had to produce ourselves, get out there, distribute because you're not dealing with the clearances and licenses. Like the song that I got famous for, 300 bars with with Game, which is this huge 15 minute long disc record to 50 Cent in the industry, um, that went down as like one of the biggest disc records. In, you know music and hip-hop history you know you can't hear on spotify you can't hear now because of the you know the clearances right like it's not clearable from that um so i always came up with the perspective and coming from that mixtape era where music was always the great and also the napster era when music wasn't selling and cd stopped selling and everybody was bootlegging it where music to me i never looked at you know i didn't look prioritize monetizing the actual transaction from that because it wasn't really within my wheelhouse but i realized the power that music had from a marketing perspective beyond obviously like me doing shows getting endorsements and, and things like that it was that network that i built like i always say that like anybody can buy a suite to to a game and come out but not anybody can will be on the field, on the bench with the players, talking to them, interacting with them. And that that's much more powerful than, you know, just just having money. Like it's that that place. And music really gave me that. That's how I was able to build such a strong network. I realized early on that, you know, music wasn't, I wasn't going to make my money because of the music industry. And also the music industry is set up with, you know, very, you know, not trend with a lack of transparency across, you know, labels, publishers, et cetera, intentionally from, if you look at it from when it was set up in the, the 40s, 50s, 60s to take advantage of artists and maximize profits for the corporations. So for me, I've never really looked at the music industry as making that money. And it's funny because like when you look at a platform like Spotify, which gets the, you know, the most critique of it since they're the biggest in the market, you know, you pay them $10 a month. I mean, you just look at their financials, right? Like they're paying 70% of their, their dollars that come out and that's why they're stock is struggling because uh, as of recent because it's and that why they've tried to grow podcasting so much because they have to pay so much out the door to publishers and to labels so people are getting paid and let's not forget that labels took a big stake in that company too when they did it and many of them sold that off but you know the in order for spotify to be successful it had to it had it pays you know a significant amount of portion to royalties um and and then you, they also gave ownership to those labels However, that doesn't necessarily translate to the artists, which is where I think the, the confusion comes from, from a lot of those artists. There's a couple things at play. One, you have to realize that just the economics of charging $10 a month to people, like, and they you're, you're paid, it's just based off of the numbers. People are listening to a significant amount of music and you know some and if you look at kids they'll listen to songs more than than adults so that's why you see a lot of pop artists getting these crazy streaming numbers but that kid is still paying ten dollars for for that service um and 70 percent of that goes back to the artists and then the labels cut that out and it's still untransparent you look in even the cd era right like the biggest selling female group of all time tlc at the height of their popularity declared bankruptcy not because they weren't making money, but because crazy. they weren't getting the money because of how that was kind of being split up. So, I've, and, and like, look, you're not, we're not going to change. Like we had to transition from, because of Napster that, that messed up the entire music market. Artists weren't getting paid anything really like from, from, from sales and it transitioned to Spotify where it's become meaningful, but I don't think that that's going to be the be all end all. It's going to be difficult for a lot of artists to just make a living there. And you take the most streamed artists like Drake who made $14 million in streaming, which sounds great. But then you look at what Drake made in the year, that's maybe 10% of his, his overall revenue. So yeah, like it matters, but he's not, I guarantee you, he's not banking on that for his, his income. And I think that's how we need to look at it. Like those platforms provide a great tool, but based on the economics and based on the price, the fact that they had to price themselves so low in order to get people to not bootleg them. Right. It's, I, I don't look at music as being like, as an, as an artist being that be all end all. However, it's, it's interesting though. It's similar, I think to Twitch, right? Cause like people yeah. ask me, oh, how much money do you make on Twitch or how much money do you make from YouTube? I mean, it's not really like, it's like part of like my thing, but that's not, that gets you, that gets you access. That gives you 
exposure that gives you your deals and brands. So it's like, you know, some of these artists the are like they're getting these people have a way to download. You get to use your statistics, the numbers, show your reach, show your stuff, and then kind of leverage that in other areas. So it is, you know, I think it's, it's, it's really complicated for some people yeah. to understand that I get that all the time. And I, and mm-hmm. I, again, it's like, it, you can't really quantify, I think how yeah, bad Stuff and is. a lot of times, like I think, and, and not that I'm trying to stick up for big tech corporations, but like you just look at the numbers, like they're paying, like Spotify pays 70% of everything that they get. Right. They've given equity to labels, whether labels sell or hold that. Some distributed to the artists, some didn't, but they right. all had like a stake at the table. They'll do those things and they also need to operate and provided this incredible service for us that's, that's given us this distribution. But I, you know, I think for, for many, it's realizing the power is in that voice and marketing. And you look at, again, the, the highest paid musicians, you look at Dr. Dre who sold this company for a billion dollars plus to, to Apple, Jay-Z, billionaire. These guys are not that because of the music. They're that because of the influence the music gave them. And then they parlayed that and built other businesses. And I followed that same model and building those connections. You have an unfair access to, to not only your, your, your listeners, but to people that want to be around you and business leaders and associates. Like if you look at Nas and how, you know, Ben Horowitz, one of the biggest, you know, venture capitalists in the world really took Nas under his wing because he's a huge hip hop fan eh, fan and brought him deal flow that made Nas more off of very small investments into companies like, you know, I believe he's in Uber and Coinbase and all these things that Nas has made way more money just from the deal flow that he's got being next to some of those people than anything else. So I think you almost have to like, look to deal with the realities of the market instead of complain about that and figure out how to maximize that power that's there. Cause you know, to me, music is the most powerful marketing tool in the world. And that's where, you know, web three and NFTs come in because, you know, unlike other transitions that we've been through where music went from vinyl to tape, to CDs, to MP3s, to uh, now streaming services, this isn't replacement. Like I think streaming is what it is. It's great. It's going to continue to grow. It'll, it's, it's a piece of that business, but there's not going to be something anytime soon that replaces that, nor does there need to be. So all of these new layers are purely additive. It's not taking away from your merch sales. It's not taking away from touring. It's not taking away from streaming. It's not taking away from endorsements. This is new ways to generate money. And what I've always said is that, you know, if you look up my bio, right? Like if you were probably to Google me right now, the first thing that would pop up, DJ Ski, first to play, Kendrick Lamar, Lady Gaga, you know, Post Malone, early with Bieber and Travis Scott and all these people. And I'm like, awesome, right? Like I was like, that's a great thing to talk about. Do you know how much I got paid from any of that? Right? Like nothing. And there was no way because they were already signed. Like I'm not, I'm not a record label. I never wanted to be. I'm not signing them. Even though I was putting them on my platforms, the biggest radio stations in the, in the world, the, the biggest TV show on, on TV for, for, for hip hop. Right. And through a YouTube channel with hundreds of millions, or actually billions of views, you know, and, and I was doing that. I would never ask people for money for those things. We were doing that to, you know, cause we believed in them and they had that talent. Um, but helping expose that, but there was no way to invest in them. And and that's, what's intriguing. Like in sports, if I believe in a player, I can, you know, bet on them. I can buy their sports card and invest in them that way. That doesn't exist. And now I think that you can do that. Like, and that's, what's intriguing. Like I'm not, I, I'm not bullish on like blockchain music streaming right now, because I think that there's so many layers that it's going to have to get through. I think maybe we get there long-term, but more importantly, it doesn't add any value to the listeners and it's not convenient. So they're not going to do that. And they don't have the rights um, for, for key songs that they want to hear. So, but what I am bullish on is like, all right, how do you monetize your community and give them access to these things and let them invest in you? If, if, if this was, you know, Travis Scott was first coming out and you were able to invest in his community through an NFT and whatever that got you, Right. That would be extremely valuable today because of his presence. And and by the way, then your fans are aligned and invested in helping you grow. The artists are able to make money every time that that flips and sells over. So I think that there's so much that's going to happen there, even in the metaverse. Like we're seeing it in, you know, we run Paris Hilton's world in Roblox and we're making, you know, real revenue off of, you know, people buying her outfits, her virtual goods, her UGC items, VIP passes in inside the game. And, you know, it's, it's purely an, a new way and a new additive way to, to monetize that and engage and also offer your community a way to grow and kind of invest and, and be a part of you. So it's purely additive, which is why I'm so excited. And I think we're entering the greatest era ever for creators. Yeah. And, and what, what is your prediction about metaverse in terms of, you know, it's a, it's a bit, it's new, the, the technology, it's kind of an interesting time and there's going to be some winners and losers, but when do you think it's like, when, the metaverse is going to be like synonymous with the, the internet where it's just like, that's like what's happening. That's, you know, it's, it's streamlined. Everything's moving and, and going. Cause it is kind of a whole new world 
in some respects. Well, what is your sort of guess on that? If you could could have totally. put it I mean, and, and look, look, that's been my lifestyle. Like we made the decision on the dash side to focus on the metaverse two years ago. And people thought I was crazy when I was talking about, you know, going to the biggest artists and managers in the world and talking about platforms like Discord, like Roblox. And they like looked at me crazy. They didn't know those names. And I was like, trust me, you'll, you'll want to be there. And Discord, now all those things are coming of age, but we're still so early, early on in this. And, you know, I have a lot of different projects coming in and that like, that's, that's my focus on, on the dash side transparently right now is, is building out, you know, great entertainment experiences um in the metaverse but i think today like the metaverse for the most part is is generally boring there's you know i think there's a lot of misdirection on where people are focusing their attention on versus me i'm going to platforms where audience already is like the barometer for me is that you know for for people to jump over it has to be more entertaining and better than something that already exists meaning that if there's a new game or a platform or world for me to spend time in that it needs to be more exciting than me watching netflix than me listening going to a show than me you know, playing Fortnite or, or any video game, right? Like, it, or at least on par and, and do that. And a lot of those things, are, it's just too early. It's it's not there yet. That's why I'm bullish on a lot of the platforms that exist, like Roblox, like even Minecraft, which is a little bit under the radar again right now. Um, there's, there's a lot of these early like metaverse style platforms that I think um, are going to be massive and, and be the foundation of what those things look like as, you know, the technology slowly evolves. I think we're still, you know, a little ways out from it becoming, you know, I guess, you know, the, repl I don't know if it replaces the internet. I think it's, I think it's just another place for us to experience that's much more, you know, interactive versus just looking at it. You can actually go and participate in a show and do these things. And like, I love Oculus. I think it's the greatest single piece of consumer electronic gadgets, you know, maybe ever, I, right? Like 299. I, I, I took a tour of a, of a development of a new building yeah. in Miami being done. Uh, actually at 11, I was like blown away because that was how they did the tour. And they got the whole setup there. You go there, you know, six people come at a time and you're like, you know, worried about yeah. jumping off the edge. And it was just crazy, right? It's, it's only like $300, I think, a it's headset. phenomenal. For, for the price point, it is what it is. But it needs to be populated. Like the challenge right now that they face is that there's not persistent sticky experiences. There's a lot of great like one-off things. Like you going through an apartment tour, awesome. But you're not yeah. going to do that every day. You can right. go in and like walk the plank, which is one of the games there. Best party trick ever. And you're scared shit the first time you do it but you're going to yeah. do it once or, you know what I mean? Like, and, and that's what I think, you know, they persistent experiences need to do. And that's one of my goals is like my, one of my, you know, kind of on, on, my, on our, our company is like, really, we want to be the ones that help usher in people to the metaverse by being, building experiences that are good and fun and, and that encourage them to come back and that are better than, you know, that take advantage of digital technology to just give them another type of experience. It's not a clone of one-to-one, -one, nothing like in real life is not going away. This is simply additive. So if you can't be at Coachella, what does that look like and feel like? How can you still participate? And by the way, you're not limited by like gravity and all these other things. So it's a different experience <laughs> that doesn't replace that's purely, again, additive. And, and that's where I'm really, really bullish on, on the entire space and why I'm, I'm so focused on it. For sure. Well, I got to ask you about your sneaker collection. I got to ask you about uh, StockX, Josh Luber, and you know, he's now doing some stuff. But he, he's, he's in the mix. What's your, what's your, what's your thing with, with sneakers and, and your connection? You know, how well do you know Josh? I've known Josh, you know, before StockX even had a name. And, you know, wow. it's funny, more kids know me despite all my, like, it's kind of weird, despite all my, uh, you know, everything that I've done in music and all the hard work that I put in, they know me now more for my sneaker collections based on videos like like this, right? And like what I've did with Complex and, and doing those things. And it's interesting. And this is again, another good story, like buying sneakers and being, you know, that was something that I did from the time I was a teenager on and before it was cool and, you know, watched it happen, you know, produced a, one of the definitive like sneaker documentaries on Netflix invested in stock X, you know, before it even had a round and uh, before it had a name. And that will be likely my like biggest success in, in the sneaker scene, just from a profit perspective. But I only got that deal flow because of I, I was in the scene. But um, I mean, I've known Josh and I'm super excited about what he's doing. We went to, to the Super Bowl together and um, we're super excited about what he's doing over at Fanatics with the trading card side. I think, you know, the business has a great future. I think that, you know, while there was, it was a little bit shaky and I get to see it from kind of both sides, especially doing a project with Tops last year when that stuff happened. I think the, the world's in good hands and very stabilized right now. And Fanatics has had a, a great track, re track record of just modernizing different industries like they've done with, with merchandise and apparel. And I think that they, you know, in, in talking with Josh, like he's very, 
he's very aware of the scene and the importance of like hobby shops and the importance of a lot of these things that have become like uh, crucial in that world. And a lot of questions that people had rightfully so when fanatics came in, like, are they going to cut everybody out and just go D to C? And I don't think they have that vision for this world. I think he's really thought through it. Well, he put out a great, you know, white paper on kind of his vision in the sports card market. And, you know, I think that the, the, the future is, and I actually think that combining like, legacy industries and, and taking those into account while applying modernization in key places is going to bring it, you know, the, the brightest future. And that's why I'm more bullish than ever and spending, you know, in our fund, you know, we're buying more cards than, than we have as of recent. So we're, we're super, super bullish on the space. And I think the industry is in good hands. He's yeah. He's a sharp guy. He's, he's fun, man. I, I really like him and Jason. Yeah. And I know Dan Fleshman's been on and Aoki, I, I, I just am impressed how kind of visionary and just, going after what they believe in and sort of making things happen. But that, yeah, big names, big, big projects. And I think the sports card industry is in a great, great place. I mean, tops, I, I don't even understand all the inner workings that Josh has explained a little bit about what's going on. And then obviously I think Michael Rubin and there, I mean, it's a big deal, right? Could you maybe just, for those that don't know, explain quickly if uh, elevator version on what is going on with tops and what the, the sort of happened. Cause I think there was like a buyout, right? Like they, like the time mm -hmm. they got out and then they're back in and, can you explain a little bit about what's happening with Tops in particular? Sure. So last year, I mean, it was um, it was kind of for the industry. It was the biggest news maybe of, of all time, right? Like Fanatic swooped in and all in one pair of swoop, like acquired the rights to MLB, MLBPA, NBA, NBA PA, NFL, NFL PA, right? And and got basically the rights, the exclusive rights, and and some of the the deals were already baked in with with Tops and Panini for NFL and NBA and MLB. So you'll still be seeing those cards for a little bit, but basically took out you know the legacy companies, not took them out, but took the licensing rights away, which is a huge part of, of those business. And Tops right. is you know the the oldest band, base, I guess, trading card manufacturer that, that was around, and you know had baseball since '53. So it was just a shock to to many to watch like, wow, Tops is not going to be making baseball cards. So after that, Fanatics then ended up acquiring Tops. So now they're going to run things not under a Fanatics brand, which is the concern of a lot of people. People are like, I don't want to buy a trading card with Fanatics logo on it. And I don't think we're going to see that. I think you're going to see, you know, you'll still see that Tops brand. So for the consumer, there's not much that changes, right? But from a, a, an ownership and a back end perspective, you'll be able to see like modernization that's that's happened with Tops being again a legacy company, and now Fanatics coming in with with a different vision and basically revolutionizing the sports merchandising space and bringing that to to the card world. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see what they have. And now they have, of course, in beyond MLB. So I mean, there's not going to be any real changes there since they just absorb Tops, who had the rights through I think this year or next year. So all those things will will stay the same. Consumers won't see much except hopefully, you know, just continuing to grow and, and better products. And, you know, we'll see what happens with NFL and NBA that, you know, when, you know, Fanatics now has tops so they can put those out under that umbrella. It won't be this year because those rights don't, uh, you, I, I forget what year those those happen for each of those leagues, but ultimately, you know, it will all be in, in, in one wheelhouse. And it was just, you know, massive shock and a massive forget for the industry that I think even took tops by by, by surprise. And, you know, Michael Rubin went in and negotiated a pretty gangster deal and, you know, um, offered equity to, to the associations that, you know, I don't think other brands were doing and just put together a very strong deal and raised a lot of money and, um, to modernize the trading card stuff. And that's what Josh is the chief vision officer for and really leading that, that strategy out. And he's been so deep in that scene. He's one of the ones that helped me get back into cards. I saw him doing it early on and I just knew it was going to happen. So, uh, yeah, it's 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 exciting, crazy times. It was super volatile for a while, but as is natural when anything when anything happens, and you know, I think that they have a, a great perspective on what's going to happen. Yeah, it's cool. No, it's it's it's. I'm very bullish on the whole industry, and obviously, those are some of the biggest, sharpest names there are. And it's, yeah. I think it's in it's in very good hands. I got to ask you, how do you? Because this is one thing I've, I've got pretty into sports cards and collecting. And as a kid, I had again not a not an impressive collection of in terms of value because of the years I was collecting, but I have sort of dove into it deeper in the past few years. Um, in particular, how do you showcase or what do you do with your cards? Because this is something that with yeah. NFTs, I'm more on the physical sports card side, but yeah. NFTs gotten into a little bit. And, you know, I've seen even some creative things now where people have like the, the picture display, right? Like they'll have yeah. a frame and then they Looking can get objects and stuff. And yeah. I think you'll start seeing this in hotels, right? Like you put your collection, you can, you check in, you can send them your stuff. You get to yeah. see what you want on the wall, right? Which is, which is very cool. And I think we'll just start seeing more of this, but what do you actually do with your sports cars? This is what I just haven't found out. Cause it's like kind of hard. Like, you don't know, like, you know, leave them in a display, you have them in a safe or whatever. And like, kind of, how do you get to like experience, enjoy them, 
but also make it convenient enough where, you know, you don't have to like go into a vault or a safe every time you want to look or show yeah, some it's, cards. It's, it's a great question. I mean, the reality is, um, you know, I used to display and love to have all my stuff, but as I really like, and especially when we launched the fund and started buying big collections, like it just makes no sense to house yourself, right? Like from liabilities, like I don't want to, if you know, your place gets into a fire, if there's an earth, like I don't want to touch that. I don't want anything to do with that. I, yeah. you know, I'd love to have them somewhere secure, somebody else touching them. I don't even want access to them myself, right? Like I know that I have them. And especially when you're dealing with like that super high end, it's just, it, it makes no sense to hold those onto yourself. So I don't hold anything of value right. on me. The, the only thing that I really display and have fun is like my own personal cards, as well as like a couple of small things. Like I've like, I'm looking at like a, a Griffey, you know, 10 rookie card, which is worth, you know, you know, 1500, I don't know, whatever, whatever the market price is, I think it's worth a little bit of money, but it's not a million dollar card, but it's just right. cool to me. So like, I'll keep a couple things to display as well as like all my Minnesota stuff that nobody else cares about. That's not really worth anything. Right. So just like a couple like cool display pieces that I think are fun. But I think, you know, once you have start having things of significant value, it just, you know, at least from my perspective, especially once it became like real money, like I'm like, I don't want to even touch that or have to deal with is it any potential issues and that's why i vaulted all my stuff so it's very very cool well i yeah i think uh you know again i think very very bullish on, on these different sports endeavors and, and i kind of closing out here want to be of interest on what you think on kind of crypto in general like bitcoin ethereum do you have any do you have any price predictions i usually like to ask my guests i don't know if you're first of all even into it at all but like january of 20 23 do you have a do you have a guess on bitcoin do you follow the markets a little bit are you into ethereum bitcoin absolutely i mean i try not to follow it on a day-by-day -day basis because you know I, I believe in it long term and all those things i think that i mean like look we're entering a volatile position you know everything's been going up for so long in every sector whether you look at cars whether you look at cards whether you yep. look at you know nfts whether you look at stocks and now we're seeing volatility especially with war with us coming out of covid like it's just yep. interesting times and it's still crazy looking back that we survived covid is and the market's just rose at their highest levels ever, which, you know, is counterintuitive to the way that, that a lot of people think. So um, I think that, you know, I'm, I'm super bullish on it long term. I think that, you know, we it, it's interesting. It's going to be interesting to see what happens on the Ethereum side, uh, which which I've oh, actually been more bullish on than Bitcoin, but they need to roll out the new versions um, in order to, I mean, the gas fees are just ridiculous and still the complexity of getting in is like, there's going to be a lot of growing pains. So I don't, I don't know where it's going to be in, in January of 23. It wouldn't surprise me if it was, you know, double where we are today. It also wouldn't surprise me if we were the same place than, than where we are. I don't, you know, it could, it could I, I think it's kind of priced in. I don't look at it going much, much lower, although there could be like short term things. I think it'll slowly bounce up and, and I'm super bullish on it long term, but I'm intrigued by seeing like, all right, will there be, you know, will Solana come on and, and become something that, you know, is like we've watched that growth. And, and today, a lot of the, the cryptocurrencies, the the main ones kind of all stay together when one rises, the others do and others do, they don't. Um, so anyways, roundabout way of saying long term, super bullish, short term, like there's, there's no way to really predict. So you can't get into it for that. Like I don't look at day, like I'm not into day trading. I'm into well, holding assets long term and, and yeah. investing in them for those reasons. But I think that, you know, the challenges that they face are, you know, there, there are some significant issues that we we face is like, uh, you know, the crypto community. One, I think is as this becomes more mainstream and say your grandmother gets into cryptocurrency, what happens when she loses her wallet address? Those things are gone forever. There's not a bank that can save it. There's not somebody that she could talk to that's going to say, oh, well, don't worry. We'll, we'll reset it for you. The decentralized nation of it, like everybody's, it's funny because while well, decentralization is a key thing is we're starting to see now too with some of the platforms taking away wallets right now. And, and when we're recording this, I was reading earlier how, you know, any Russian users, they, you know, I, I believe it was OpenSea had to take away their, their access because it's yeah. from the government, but they're like, wait, isn't this decentralized? And the, the scary thing is like the fraud, like, you know, we know, we've both know people that have gotten to take, you know, their wallets compromised and, and taken advantage of, and there's not really any recourse. Once it's gone, it's, it's gone yet, you know, for all the decentralization of it, it still faces those issues where once you are holding it in some of these other platforms, they can take it away. Everything is arguably more traceable because once you trace a wallet, which we've, sh which has been shown that like 
it's very difficult to hide that and keep that hidden. There always will be one week. All it takes is one week link and then you can track everything, right? So it's actually the opposite of that. And that's why I think a lot of governments are embracing Bitcoin because they can actually now track their people. Most people are not going to be able to keep it anonymous for that, which is scary and bad. So there's just like a lot of issues, but long term, long term, super bullish on everything Web3. I think it's, you know, an obvious choice. And for there's so many great use cases that we haven't seen. And I don't think that, you know, we're, we're in the early innings of, but there's, there's going to be a lot of volatility on, on all these sides, even the NFT market coming up, I think so. For sure. And and what about uh, social platforms that you know, do you do you do any personal streaming or YouTube stuff within you know videos? You have a lot of content across a lot, across a lot of different platforms. Are you particularly bullish and, and just enjoy more than others like YouTube or Twitch? Do you have any feelings on those in particular? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, we did a ton with Twitch when um, when the pandemic hit, especially at our space and on the music side. We've you know we broadcast on the, the the audio side at Dash everything from like all of Insomniac's festivals, including EDC on. So we did over like six hundred streams, I believe, on on Twitch wow. through once the you know over the last couple of years. Um, but it's a challenge. From I mean, the, the challenge that you face on a lot of those platforms is the monetization just isn't yep. there yet. It's it's exposure, but when you're producing these big high-end you know festivals that cost a lot to do you're not making your money back so you're starting to see a lot of people pull pull back on the entertainment side so i think it's it's still again super early on that i think that if you can be lean and mean and for for certain people like gamers it makes so much sense because there's not like i can outside of buying a computer and the streaming software there's no costs it's just you gaming and it's something that you can do for eight hours a day granted it's a lot of work but you can do that and build audience versus yeah. if you do a music festival and performance for an hour it's a tremendous cost behind it. It's all those things. It's a shorter streaming time. It's just tough to make a business from that. So from like an entertainment perspective, um, we've actually pulled back from, from focusing on some of those like live streams outside of, you know, things that we're already doing and happening and get brands and things to come on just because I think it's still, you know, they haven't figured out a great monetization uh, method for it to justify those costs and been great for that type of creator. They've been great for certain types of creators. Um, you know, YouTube early on, we was, you know, I had pretty much like the first music vlog we you know revolutionized the way music videos were shot we were the first to shoot digitally we generated three billion views on our ski tv channel and you know for, for me it was you know a moment in time and i got out of that it's just like from creator burnout like we were doing a video every day for almost 10 years right and um, once i started not being in every video it started losing steam on that and it just wasn't sustainable um and, but that was before a lot of the monetization was there so you know i was almost there too early it's been the story of my life so but you know there, there's a lot of you know for me um, I'm, I'm really focused on the metaverse and like kind of what's happening with Web3 because you can monetize it so much better. I don't think we, we made a bet even when we launched Dash, not focused on traditional advertising and we made the right one. We saw what the struggles that other companies like Pandora that are bigger than us had. We saw what ATT did once Apple rolled out their ad tracking, uh, you know, the, the limiting what ad tracking could do and how that's crushed stocks like Facebook and anybody that's an advertiser. and and. I don't think that that's the way. I think the way is building community, engaging them, and letting them like almost invest or, or you know take ownership of of what they believe in and what they're passionate about, like we do with sports cards and with, with different things. So that's why I think that that's where where I'm dedicating my time and energy right now. You you say that it's funny. You it's like you're almost like you said you're almost too early, right? You feel like you yeah. see that you're like ahead of the curve. You see it, so it's got to be refreshing and nice in a lot of ways, but also at times maybe a little frustrating or even oh. like you're so early that you like jump the gun and miss it, even though you're, you're like, you're way ahead. It doesn't work or it takes totally. a while to catch up. So it's a uh, story of my good. life. Right. But it's, it's a look, it's a good problem to have. No, it's a good problem. I'm sure. And I'm sure some of these guys and, and investments and, and uh, major players are also noticed that, right? Like that I've, I've talked to my friends that are in their fifties, good friends and stuff. And like, they say that all the time. Like I want to be around the 25 and the 30 year olds and like around to see what's happening and kind of feel the energy of what's next. Right. Cause it is uh, some of these things just, it's under your nose, right? The next big thing, the next totally. big TikTok or, or Twitch or whatever, like those ideas, those platforms, those things are there ready to go. And it's just what's next. And, and, and everything moves so fast now. It's a, it's a bit of, I feel like I have FOMO. You know, I, I constantly, I don't like to miss stuff. I don't want to miss out, but it's just like, there's so many different things going on in so many different directions. How do you, let's close with this. How do you deal with that? Because, you know, I kind of asked you this about saying no, but how do you deal with, uh, all these different distractions, if you would, you know, the different things, because you could, I'm sure you turn your phone on, we're done with this podcast and you're going to have messages yeah, on Telegram, my gram, your gram, Instagram, you know, discord, 
all these spots. Like, do you ever find yourself, you wake up and you're like, man, it takes me an hour to even just like go through my, my messages and inbox and email and sure. all these different things. Cause it's a rabbit hole. You talk to one guy here, you talk to another Instagram, you talk to another here. And the second you're in there, you're kind of like, you know, reopening combos. How do you deal with that? hundred percent. I mean, you just have to figure out how to, and like, look, it's a constant battle and it's constantly evolving as new platforms, things do. It's like, you want to be there, but you can't like also get, get distracted. So it's just a fine line and you just have to, you know, have good self, great self-discipline ultimately at the end of the day to, you know, like I try to figure out what I need to do and what my priorities are and put those things first and just, you get them done and, and, you know, you can cut through the noise and then jump in when you get those times and moments. But, you know, again, prioritize, get done every day. Like it's little battles. It's winning little battles today. What do I want to accomplish? What do I need to get done get that done and then everything else kind of around that will will work itself out yeah i think that i think that's 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 great advice and 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 what give me on the way out here what are what do you got going on you've done some major projects university of michigan the michigan ohio state mm -hmm. game you're doing minnesota vikings djing you've got uh you just did nascar what is like anything you can reveal maybe some stuff you can't yet but what, what are kind of some things people can keep an eye on you and see that you have coming up what, what are you excited about yeah, for sure. I'm super excited about some metaverse announcements that we have, not only in some of the platforms and games and developments and projects that we're building on the the, the Dash side, um, but some of the personal things that you'll be seeing me announce and and, and come out with um, in, in the coming months. Um, on the, in the the DJ and sports side, you continue to see me at like you know some of the coolest sporting events and funnest venues, you know, uh, and releasing really fun, cool collaboration projects, um, kind of at the intersection of like sports, music, and culture, including more cards with tops. There'll be another project that we're involved in with them as well as several other things uh coming on on soon and you know releasing my own things and there's gonna be a lot of fun fun things on both sectors very cool all right well everyone i, I appreciate you watching this has been a really big treat i appreciate scott keeney coming on this is episode number 168 also known yeah. as dj skiing again tell them where they can follow you got yourself on twitter instagram do you any of those you, you prefer to post on or yeah, I mean, like I have to, I have to force myself to do it. It's one thing I should do better of is posting on those things. But yeah, just uh, DJ Ski and social media from you know Twitter, Instagram are are probably most active. My Discord, um, DJSki.com is where we do a lot of our drops that you know sell out. So make sure you check it out. They're really fun, and if you're into to sports and music at all, you will enjoy them. Um, and yeah, just look for me. You know, hopefully in the, in the metaverse. All right. Well, listen, I do. I, I really appreciate the time, man. This has been a treat. Of course, for, Jeff. For thank you. Team. And, and I hope we get to meet up in person soon. And, and uh, yeah, man, it's a, it's a pleasure. Really learned a lot and very well spoken, very inspiring. And I can tell you're a entrepreneurial crusher and really, really, uh, yeah, learned a lot. Thank you so much. Appreciate you, brother. Thank you, Jeff. Have a great one. Cheers, man. All right, guys, that was DJ Ski. We got more big pods coming your way. This was episode number 168 going out on all the audio outlets as well of course on youtube and uh, appreciate everyone thank you so much we'll see you soon and a big big thank you to dj ski